Thank you. Uh, yes, questions. I'll take questions. Uh, go ahead. Sure. Uh, Mark Danner, a couple of questions. I mean, we could make our questions all night. We are absolutely fascinated by what you do. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, first, uh, a little historical question. Do you know who is responsible for the Israeli military uh, strategic doctrine of preemptive strike? What does it have to do with me? I'm a Jew. Uh, when you ask me about China's uh, preemptive strike. No, I'm serious, really, seriously. Not surprised, and it is interesting. There is so much I didn't go into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Zionism is based is a is a copy and imitation of evangelical Christianity, right. not vice versa. Yeah. So related to the last point you made, and I ask this to you as, as as a religious Jew, as as a rabbi, but one that because I have a deep affinity for the Jewish people, I have to ask. Even though Israel doesn't represent you, we we know that there are many Jews there who are trying to. to live out their faith, pious Jews. But from an eschatological point of view, when you look at that, the future of that land and all the injustices that have been committed, um, surely there is a God of justice who is feeling that his people have quite violated those, uh, those laws. I mean, how, how do you see the future of, of the Jewish people who decided to settle in Israel when, when we can look at some of the Old Testament uh, prophecies that you, know, you almost hear the, the same cries out of the land today. You know, orphans and widows are being treated, etc. So. Right, okay, so first, w while it's true that it says in the Bible that if the Jews do not uh, fulfill the law in the land, the land will spit them out. Um, and there have been rabbis that have said, because of the uh, lack of religious observance in Israel, um, that would explain uh, all the wars they're having. At the same time, if you remember, it also says in the Bible, by Sodom, Sodom, um, God agreed that if he could find ten people, ten righteous people, he would save the whole city. So you never know. All you need is 10 righteous people to save an entire city. Hopefully, that's what I pray, that that's what God is thinking. Now, not only there, I'm in Washington, D.C. We have the same you know, problem over here, but um, that's what I'm thinking. Any other questions? Yes? Well, I, I'm not sure I agree with you that Zionism is not a response to anti-Semitism. Now, I understand everything you have said, and I agree with it, but beyond that, if there had not been anti-Semitism in the 20th century, Zionism would have been a minority movement among Jews. At the time of the Balfour Declaration, a petition was sent to President Wilson by many of the leading Jews in the United States opposing the creation of any sort of Jewish state. Reform Judaism was opposed to Zionism. Before the Pittsburgh Platform, was it? The Pittsburgh Platform, was Going it? Going back to 1885 and the Pittsburgh Platform. Mm -hmm. Before that, in 1841, when the first Reform Temple was dedicated in Charleston, South Carolina, the rabbi said, this city is our Jerusalem. Yes. This country is our Palestine. Yes. So I think the majority of American Jews were opposed to Zionism mm -hmm. until the Nazi period, until they felt something needed to be done. That's one point. I just want to ask one other question. I wonder if you share my view that Zionism is in retreat in America. We are, I edit the publications of the American Council for Judaism. And we are now celebrating our 75th year 
of maintaining the classical Reformed Jewish idea. Now, Zionism never was actually adopted by American Jews. Most American Jews never thought, we are in exile, this is not our country, that is our country. We've confused sympathy for Israel with Zionism. But Stephen Cohen at the Hebrew Union College says that Israel is now the most divisive issue in the American <laughs> Jewish community. When he tries to raise money for Jewish federations, people demand that none of this money go to Israel. Otherwise, they will give nothing. So I believe Zionism is in retreat, and that Judaism, whether the Orthodox or the classical reform, will once again come back. That's my hope. I wonder if you have that optimism. Well, uh, as far as Judaism, as far as anti-Semitism um, being the driver for the success of Zionism, I, I would say yes and no. Yes, it's true that what motivated many, most Jews to support Israel was anti-Semitism. But Israel is not going to help cause, only because they were made to believe falsely that Israel is somehow a solution or a response to anti-Semitism. give you an example. Well, there was Leo Pinsker that said the existence of a state of Israel will contribute to the reduction of anti-Semitism all over the world. Certainly it has done just the opposite. But a more recent example, there was, I think it was Vox News or Vice News, one of the two, um, did a, a video, you can find it on YouTube, about the uh, exodus, so to speak, of the Jews from France to Israel because of the anti-Semitism in Paris, in France. And they interviewed Nathan Sharansky, who is the head of the Jewish agency and head of this thing. And uh, this, this woman reporter asks Sharansky, she says, with this uppity, like, mole rat accent, she says, don't you think it's a little crazy to tell people to go from Paris to Israel because of safety concerns, right? And he said to her, he said, yeah, you're right. Um, Paris has a lot of good laws against anti-Semitism, et cetera. But over here, there's a feeling of safety and you feel at home. Remember what Herzl said. It, 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 it's the, the feeling, it's the symbol. It's the, so in, in other words, the, people have been duped into thinking that going to Israel or having Israel or supporting Israel reduces anti-Semitism, but it really doesn't, it's the opposite. Uh, to go back to my analogy about the car skidding at 60 miles an hour, we all know that our instincts tell us if this car does skid on an ice patch, slam on the brakes. Our driving teachers taught us, you do that, you're dead. So imagine somebody saying, you know what, S if you're, car is skidding, slam on a brakes. It may, you feel safe. That's what it means. That's what it's like when, when, when Netanyahu goes to Paris and he says, you know, come to Israel, it's your home. He goes to Denmark and he says, come to Israel. All he's doing is bringing the Jews to a less safe place and increasing anti-Semitism all over. So you're right, anti-Semitism has been responsible, but only because people have been scammed into thinking that Israel is a, is a uh, uh, effective response to anti-Semitism. And in both and, those cases, in Denmark and Paris, the chief rabbis... Yes, in both Israel. those cases, just like in Mexico, because yeah. all over the world, whenever Netanyahu does that, the, the, pe the people say, please don't do this to us, because, you know what, but, but it's a win-win situation for Israel, because guess what? More people are going to move there. Why should they care? Remember, the Jewish people exist to support Israel. Yeah. The core concept that you presented, that Zionism is not only not Judaism, but it's an antithesis of Judaism. It's an antidote. Right. So, but you've also presented some points that I'm sure with more time you would greatly elaborate, but the it, it, it seems that Another way to look at Zionism is one of many 
European colonial projects to create false ideologies for geostrategic purposes. And I've looked at the idea that you had the, a number of partitions at the end of World War II, where it was going to be hard to go back to 19th century colonialism. And Roosevelt even constantly scolded Churchill, we're not fighting this war, to go back to your 18th and 19th century methods. So new spin on it, partitioning of Israel, of, of Palestine, partitioning of the Indian subcontinent when India is about to emerge as a nation. And every one of these instances of these sort of colonial projects under a new facade have led to the most enduring crises in major parts of the world. I wonder, does that, is that something that you would, with proper time, be able to elaborate? With proper time. Um, this is the, the summary of a course. Uh, the British colonial project, the, the relationship between the British and the Zionists were kind of like codependent. They kind of used each other for their own purposes. And a, a, as it so happens, the first people on record to say that if you send the Jews to uh, the Holy Land, to uh, uh, Israel or Palestine, what it was then, um, will bring Western culture into um, the Middle East were the evangelical Christians. And that was a way for them to um, uh, push forward their agenda of bringing the Jews into uh, the state of Israel, making a state of Israel, either converting them or uh, Armageddon comes or, 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 or Satan comes, depending upon which, which one you ask. Um, but, but yeah, the Zionists, however, wanted, even before British even without British colonialism, they wanted uh, Zionism. And the British, even without Zionism, wanted uh, colonialism. That's why how the United States started, right? Um, they found uh, good partners with each other. They kind of, they're codependents. They like used, they, they exploited each other. I agree. Yes? I don't think this is uh, so much a question, but I really have to thank you for making it so clear that Really, from what I heard you say, Zionism is based on secularism. It's a secularistic, nationalistic approach, which has nothing to do with the foundation of Judaism, as you've expressed and so I have always understood. It. Yes, this is true. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes. Well, again, uh, thank you, as other speakers have said, and thank you, Dr. Nadinsky, for arranging this. Can you tell us more about um, your work, uh, other places that you lecture, where we can be following you? Um, okay. YouTube, um, uh, Facebook, uh, truth. You know, I'm going to leave Norton with a list of um, places where you can pick up some lectures. There's a, uh, I spoke at a rally by the, uh, in Brussels by the EU, in front of the EU, uh, where I described in short, it was 15 minutes. It was not a educational, it was more inspirational, right? But um, about Zionism and, and, and the Israeli army. Uh, there are other such lectures that you could find on YouTube. Wait for my, my three, four volume book to come out. Then uh, it, it really is complicated. You know, you, you, you want to see, uh, I, I want to, as long as you mentioned, I want to, just read you something, you want to say how confused the Zionists are and how hard they work to conflate Judaism with Zionism because it's like, you know, they needed Judaism because, well, they wanted Jews. And it's like, you have a, let's say you have a mango-flavored jelly belly. You know, so, so you need to make it look and taste like a mango because mango lovers will eat or jelly bean lovers but it has no nutrition. The Zionists took Judaism, like artificial Jewish flavor and artificial Jewish color, in order to attract the Jews. And, but listen to this. When I have something very, it, it, it's, 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 it's funny. So Max Nordau, who I mentioned before, I'm reading from Amnon Rubinstein's book. It's called From Herzl to Rabin. Max Nordau um, suggested that when they create the state of Israel, our Sabbath, Saturday, should be replaced by the more universal Sunday. 
as the, the day of rest for the week. Now, another Zionist, Achar Ha'am, his real name was Ginsburg. This was just like his pen name. It means basically random person. Now, he's like one of the people, but who, re quote, who regarded the Jewish Sabbath as the incarnation of the Jewish spirit, was flabbergasted and infuriated by such an idea. And from his Odessa home, he directed at Nordo words of fury and scorn. Quote, now one thing I want to tell you, Achad Ha'am was an atheist. He did not believe in Judaism. But listen what he says. Not one word escaped the mouth of this Zionist sage, which would testify that his heart rebels against the cancellation of the Sabbath because of its historical and national value. The whole question in his eyes is purely religious, and therefore he excludes himself from any direct commitment. He, the free thinker, will have his own appropriate day of rest, bereft of any religious intent, and he does not care whether the Sabbath queen of Judaism exists or not. So here you have an atheist insisting that we should maintain the Sabbath because it's the queen of Judaism, but there's no God here. There's no God, there's no Bible, there's no... What is this? This again is Herzl's thing, that it's a slogan. Judaism becomes a slogan. It's not real. You could be an atheist. You don't believe in God. It, and then he, then he quotes Jacob Klatskin, who uh, lambasted Achad Ha'am in, in newspaper Die Welt, said, quote, we don't need any Jewish content for Zionism. And um, the goal of Zionism is called to deny any conception of Jewish identity based on spiritual criteria. And Achad Ha'am, atheist, Sabbath queen, that's spiritual criteria. Now, can anybody make heads or tails out of this? No. Without God, without the Bible, there's no Judaism. Without God, we don't have a religion. There's no Judaism. I wouldn't know who to pray to. What am I, it doesn't make any sense yet. No, we have to have a cultural Judaism. We have to have a Sabbath. You can't have a Sunday. It, 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 it's just, again, it's just slogans. It's symbols. That, that, that's what Judaism becomes. It's, it's a nationalism without defining even what a Jew is. The, the car is careening 60 miles an hour and it's skidding. You no time to think. Just hold the wheel. Join us Zionists. We're going to protect the Jews and that's it. Any other questions? Yes. And I guess, as, excuse me if I don't formulate it so well, um, the thread in American uh, domestic politics from uh, uh, Justice Lewis Brandeis, the Zionist Organization of America and the Supreme Court, and Woodrow Wilson, uh, on through uh, Morgenthau, uh, Felix Frank, for Rabbi Silva, uh, and numerous others on one hand, and a handful of the Rabbi Elmer Burgers and the Ellen Baumfelds and a friend uh, here who spoke so eloquently and a friend uh, a host this afternoon and Jeffrey. Um, why aren't the numbers of those I just mentioned, four or five, increasing? Uh, why is it the, the voice of uh, Tikkun, which sometimes uh, is notable, uh, the voice of the Uns Review, which often is notable, or uh, Mondo Weiss, which is un, uh, often a notable, J Street, which is sometimes notable. Why aren't their numbers increasing, at least to the knowledge of the late person like myself? Uh, that, and why, uh, we're talking about words here, are we not so much? At least you mentioned duped, you mentioned mythology, etc. These are words, these are sound bites. These are things that seduce people's minds. Um, are we not as a body politic, as humanity, above being seduced, above being manipulated, above being coward, above being... Um, Insecure because people say, I'm a self hating Jew, you're a self hating Jew. Where are we in terms of uh, now and the near term of the way forward? Uh, I would like to think I'm not seduced by anything that's illogical, uh, factually dishonest. Why are so many uh, 
allegedly do or mythologize. How can we debunk this in addition to speaking facts analytically clear and articulate as you have done? Where are we going? And where are we? Uh, the answer to the, your question about whether we're above being seduced, the answer is no, we're not. Um, the advertising industry proves it. Um, taste test, taste test after taste test uh, says that in blind tests, Starbucks is overcooked. The coffee beans are burnt, yet they're making the most money. Everybody knows that advertising works. And if you, you, you have the right image, people will follow you and do what you want. I'll tell you a couple of stories. I, I, I was once at a many year, a few years ago, I think three years ago, there was a massive rally, protest rally in Foley Square in New York against the government of Israel's intention to remove the divinity exemption of the Jewish yeshiva students and draft them into the Zionist indoctrination camp, which they call their army. About 40,000 people were there. I was the official spokesman for the press. For that, We got very little press, very little. Like the forward interviewed me, and Jared Kushner's newspaper, I forget the name offhand, also had a, had a reporter there. But we didn't get really any, a, a, any press. And besides me, myself, the organizers had also hired a very high-powered um, PR guy, promotions guy, who's, who, who's jo he helps politicians and get votes. And, and he tells me, and before we met, we, we spoke to each other on the phone. He tells me, here's what we got to tell people. We got to tell people the reason why we're against the draft is because the Jewish parties, the Orthodox parties, did not vote for the, the winning uh, parties. The, uh, and, and now the uh, government is power brokering and they're punishing us which was not the message at all. The message was, for religious reasons, we don't want to go to the, the, the Israeli army. So I told him, no, that's not the message. How can we say that? He says, listen to me. I want to tell you a rule. If somebody asks you a question about what this rally is about, you'll explain it to them and they will walk away. About two minutes after they walk away, they will not remember what you told them, but they will remember how they felt about what you told them. If they felt good about what you told them, they will be on your side. If they felt queasy about it, they will not. Don't give them intellectual stuff. Give them whatever will make them feel good. Anybody that ever ran for office knows that. Anybody that ever sold a product and advertised for it knows that. No, the answer is no. The world runs on feelings and emotions much more than intellectualism in our synagogue. One day, during one of the Sabbath meals, this man over here, Jonathan, was sitting to my right. To my left was another one of the, the uh, parishioners who was from London. And I had mentioned that when I was a kid, I went to school in the United States of America like everybody else, and they taught us about the American Revolution how the British were disgusting monsters and they did taxation without representation and, and all sorts of things. And we Americans were heroes and rebelled against the oppressors. And then when I got older, I went to a post-secondary rabbinical institution in, in Ocean County, New Jersey, where I met people from all over the world because a lot of people, and I met for the first time in my life, people from England. I had once mentioned to this guy, you guys did taxation without representation. And he looks at me, and he tells me, what? He said, in Britain, they taught them a whole different story. They taught them that the Americans were, were, were subversive, and they were rebellious, and they would always side with Britain's enemies, and they were terrorists. What is the Boston Tea Party except an act of terrorism? And the fact that they didn't give them votes, well, you expect to give them votes? Like, like the, similar to the way the Israelis speak about the Palestinians. We, were more, we gave them more privileges than they deserve. Anyway, he didn't say all of this. What he did say was this, this, this British guy. He says, I never speak to Americans about what I learned in, in, in British school. I, 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 
I did hear that from my British friends. And at this Sabbath meal, I asked him to tell Jonathan uh, what he learned. He said, I don't. Americans always get upset. So he says, I really don't care. Just tell me. He says, no, I don't do it. So here we have uh, Americans. They're learning one story. In Britain, they're learning a completely different historical narrative. You tell me how to be objective. I'll tell you, how to, I'll tell you my view on how to do it. The people who came with me from here, here from New York know that. Just wanted to make one comment when you said how do you, I was asked by a radio broadcaster who was Jewish in New England, said when I criticize Israel on my program, people call me a self-hating Jew. He said, how would you respond to that? I said, well, tell them the first self-hating Jews were the prophets. <laughs> <laughs> that's fine so so I'll tell you my own personal choices I, I as a religious Jew as a rabbi consider it very very important to protect my mind uh, King Solomon in, in the book of Proverbs says in English it means of all the things that you protect protect your mind more than anything else because your life depends on it and what that means is, I don't read any newspapers, I don't read any magazines, I do not own a television, I will not read any editorials, I will not form an opinion on something unless I get scientific evidence first. Simple, very simple. If you were, you asked me that question, I'm going to throw it back at you. If you were on trial for murder, you were a defendant, and you had a jury, and you had to help select the jury, and you knew that one of those jurors read one newspaper article about your case, would you allow him on the jury? No. So you see, people, yeah, when people's lives are at stake or even their money is at stake, they know that those jurors should not read anything unless, it, unless they have the, the, the um, uh, uh, controlled environment of the court. You want to be objective, my opinion, my choice, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a rabbi, I live a, what, what do you call it, a, a hermetic life, kind of. <laughs> you want to be objective, my opinion, treat your, every decision you make as if you were a member of the jury. Absorb only information that you know is accurate. And more than that, once you formed an opinion, you know that it's going to be difficult for you to unform it. So, I don't know if you have children, but if you have children, don't let them read or see random opinions about things. Give them facts, facts, figures. I haven't been in Washington, D.C. for a long time, but I was here. I remember um, the first day President Clinton went, got into the January 20th, he got into the White House the first time he was elected. And I picked up a Washington Post for my daughter, who was a little kid in school. And um, the reason is because they were having, I think, fifth grade, sixth grade, a fifth grade, a mock election. As a class, who do you vote for? You know, some, I don't even remember who's running against him. Then the first time, who's running against Clinton? Do you remember whoever? I don't know. You vote for this? Anybody remember? Bush. Bush. The first time, yeah? Okay, who votes for Bush? Who votes for Clinton? Fine. When it came to parents, teachers, uh, associated PTA meeting, I complained. I said, what are you teaching these kids? I said, not a single one of them knows why they should vote for Bush. And not, no, none of them know why they should vote for Clinton. What you're teaching them is to cast your vote for no good reason. You're teaching them to cast your vote based on your feelings. Even though you're ignorant, you're uninformed, you have no idea what you're doing, cast your vote. People grow up and they never get out of that mode. No, you should teach the children, like our tradition tells us, our Bible, our Talmud. It means teach your mouth to say, I don't know. Teach us, teach us if you don't know something, say you don't know. Do not form an opinion unless you know. Here in America, everybody's entitled to the opinion. They're entitled. But if you want your opinion to be accurate, then make sure you have accurate for my little sister always used to ask me, how come I always win arguments when we argue with her little sister? I said, sister, I recently told this to uh, the, the voice engineer 
and by the radio station, by the radio show I do, he, he said he, he liked my arguments. I, I told them both. You want to know the secret to win your arguments, to be, to be right in your arguments? Always argue for the right side. That's it. Don't choose a side and then argue for it. First figure out which side is right, and then, I, I want to tell you, I, I don't understand politics, really. Politics, I'll tell you why. Because somebody mentioned to me, this guy over here, he mentioned, he said, I don't understand. Let's say you're, you're a Republican, you're a right-wing guy, right? So, all right, so, so you're for capitalism, you like less welfare, whatever. But at the same time, that means that you are against gun control, right? And it comes with a whole set of positions. It, what is the connection between those positions? Nothing. It's become like color war teams. You're a Republican, you're a Democrat, it's like color war teams. You have a whole set of positions, you have a whole set of positions. No, this is all messed up. Everybody, my opinion, my opinion, should, should, should uh, evaluate each issue on its own merits, scientific merits, and then come out with an opinion. And if not, you don't have to have an opinion on anything. Everything say you don't know, that's all. Next question. Yes. Let's take, one, let's take one or two more questions. One or two more questions. Yeah. Gloria, right? Uh, yes, my question has to do with uh, the end of your speech. I really appreciate what you said. I really learned a lot. My question is very simple. How simple to formulate, difficult to answer, of course. How to disengage Judaism from Zionism? What do you think has to be done for Pe disengaging? People have to study Judaism. And people have, to, people have to study Judaism, people have to study Zionism. It's like anything else. You need, we need to educate ourselves and, as far as activity is concerned, tell everybody Israel is not the Jewish state. Israel does not represent the Jews. That doesn't mean if somebody, want, if somebody wants to support Israel, let them, America supports Egypt and Afghanistan, right? Egypt doesn't represent the Jews. Afghanistan doesn't represent the Jews. They can support Israel without Israel representing the Jews. Make is, t tell, if you meet a Zionist, if somebody tells you the Jewish state, the Jews, uh, you're an anti-Semite if you don't like Israel. Say, what does Israel have to do with the Jews? Israel's a Jewish state. Who says? Challenge. Ask. This claim that Israel makes, it's not a question of Judaism is not enmeshed with Zionism. People are confused about it primarily because Israel makes a claim. They want to exist. Let them exist. Let them not exist. Even let them exist. Let them flourish. Let them get all the money. Whatever they want to do. But be Egypt. Be Afghanistan. Don't be the Jewish state. That's step one to solving the whole problem. You got to know. But before you know how to, how to deal with your opponent, how to deal with a conflict, you need to know who the parties in the conflict are. If you think, if, if, if Jared Kushner thinks, he's the one supposed to fix this, if he thinks, that the parties over here are the Jews versus the Palestinians, forget it. He's up the creek without a paddle before he starts. It is Israel versus their political opponents. And we need to tell that. We need to tell the world Israel does not represent the Jewish people. They don't speak in the name of the Jewish people. If they want to be a country, let them be a country. I have no problem with that. If somebody says, I want to support Israel, not as the Jewish state, all we're doing is we're focusing on that one claim, what I call centralization. Israel claims to represent the Jewish people, to be the state of the Jewish people. Wrong. False claim. What do you call it? Uh, fake news. That is fake news. That's how to do it. Publicize to everybody. That is, e even if you are a Zionist, how in the world did Israel come to represent the Jews? Again, I live in America, my father's from Poland, my mother's from England, a bunch of people in the Middle East in 1948 make a country and now they're my representatives? How in the world does that work? That's like crazy. The power of what? The power of narrative. The what? The power of narrative. The power of narrative, yes, yes. So we need to, we need to, that's the easiest part of Zionism to refute. Because it doesn't make any sense. People can argue definition of a nation, you know, Jews, languages, history. You mentioned to me earlier, you go back a thousand years in history, this, this is not a narrative. This is a claim that Israel makes. The claim is, Benjamin Netanyahu comes to America. Last year, he made a claim. I am speaking in the name of all the Jews. 
not, that's not narrative. That's a lie. I'm serious. What in the world does that mean? You're speaking, you're prime minister of a country, got it, you got elected by them. But no, you're not. If, if the king of Bulgaria would come here and say, I'm speaking in the name of all the Jews, all the Jews would get up and say, you're out of your mind. That's what we should do, Jews and non-Jews, when Netanyahu comes here. We're not saying that we want to kill you. Nobody wants to kill anybody. Nobody wants anybody to be harmed. But cut out this nonsense that you represent the Jews. You are a country like any other secular country. And, and, and that's it. And now at least we know who the parties are in the conflict. You can't solve a conflict unless you know who the parties are, right? One more question. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome.